Well, we're all needing to forgive Paula today. I was expecting cookie dough. Um, <laughs> thank you, Matt, for starting the trend. We, uh, we hope that all those who come beyond will do even better children's stories. But you see, this is, this is where we find our scripture today. The scripture says that not only did Jesus feed 5,000 at one time, and that was just counting the men, but that there's another time here in scripture, recorded here in Matthew, where Jesus feeds 4,000, all at the same time, not counting women and children. Sorry, guys. I really wish that they had had better counting methods and that they had been more inclusive, like us. We do stories for children. We do children's church for children and their parents. So we will count you and your children if you attend and enjoy, because afterwards there'll be potluck, you see. And Jesus comes to his disciples and says, we've been having church here for this long time. For three days they'd been having church. It's time for potluck. What have we got in the larder? seven loaves of bread. This story is different from the last one in that the numbers are different. Tell me, how many basketfuls did they pick up at the end of the feeding of the 5,000? 12. Twelve. Who picked up the pieces? The disciples. How many disciples were there? Twelve. So why do you think God did, uh, Jesus did the whole feeding of the 5,000? Who was it really for? The disciples. So here you have him doing it again. This time, though, it's seven loaves of bread, and it's seven basketfuls picked up at the end. I like to think that seven is an important number. It's a prime number, and it is also the number of days in the week of creation. And here it is, ha, the seventh day of the week. And you have decided that on that day, that special day that God made special at the beginning, number seven, you have decided to come and worship him in a place made ready for you called a church building. Just know, too, that like the people that Jesus fed with seven loaves, you have come expecting to be fed. I thank you for that. I thank you for your trust because I put my trust in the one who fed those 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread. So I hope you don't put your trust in me so much to deliver the meal that you came for, but that you trust Jesus. His disciples had learned to trust him. And so it is in this context that he teaches them to pray. Some of you have been with us in the previous weeks, and you know that we are at that point in the Lord's Prayer, what we know as the Lord's Prayer, where we say that phrase, forgive us. It's a really hard phrase. And thank you, Paula, that was a fantastic thing because <laughs> seeing Matt put his fingers in the peanut butter again was just awesome. And, and yes, uh, I would have needed forgiveness, and I think if my mother had been making those peanut butter cookies and saw me put my fingers in the peanut butter, the wooden spoon would have become an extension of her arm, and as quick as a flash would have wrapped me over the knuckles, peanut butter and all. <laughs> that wouldn't have stopped it getting into my mouth, though. <laughs> she learned quickly, and she started giving me those, you know, those rotating things, the mixer things, the mixer blades? Raise your hand if you loved licking those things, man. I tell you what, cookie dough, I think that's why they invented cookie dough ice cream, is because all of us liked eating. And you know, there are some moms that say, oh, but the eggs aren't cooked. Forget it. I like the cookie dough. Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, and we're to that point in his, in his teaching where he says, say this. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, this is the, the version that I learned when, when I was young. Maybe, maybe you, you learned a different one. Uh, maybe you were more of the English tradition and you used the word trespasses. I always loved 
you know, because it's a specific, specific, tres, tres, trespass. It's not trespasses so nicely. It's tres, trespasses. Forgive us our, our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I believe that, that Jesus is showing us that there's a, pr- there's a protocol, there's a, there's a progression in this forgiveness thing. Number one, number one in the progression, and it's really only a, a two-step thing here. Number one is forgive others. She read for us Matthew 6.14, which says, forgive the men, forgive the people around you before you come to me and ask me for forgiveness. So Jesus is teaching here, and he says there's a way to do this, and the way to do this is you must forgive others first. Then God will forgive you. But let's look at the word debt. Forgive us our debts. Debt, to me, implies uh, an agreement. An agreement implies stipulations. Okay, I'm not going all legal on you here, but I want to draw your attention to the fact that the Ten Commandments, as we call them, are the stipulations in the agreement that God has made with the children of Israel at Sinai. He would be their king, their God. They would be his people. He would protect them and make them prosperous. They would worship him as, one, as the one and only God of the universe. He would keep his promises, and they would keep their promises. The stipulations, what we call the Ten Commandments, spell out the particulars of the relationship that is formed by the agreement. Debt implies an agreement. Because there is an agreement, there is a relationship. So here we are, in one simple sentence, Jesus says, when you pray, say, forgive us our debts. Now he's talking in in the context of an agreement which implies a relationship, and something has happened in that relationship, something is out of kilter. That there is a debt load on someone in that relationship. In later times, God describes this relationship, I believe, in marital terms. Those of you who understand what I'm talking about, we can include the book of Hosea, for example. In fact, many of the other prophets record uh, God pleading with his people to honor their vows to him as a husband would plead with a wife or as a wife would plead with a husband. The Old Testament is full of stories of the good times, though. And I'm, I'm pleased to tell you that it's, it's not just the bad times, but it's, it's also full of the good times. When Israel was acting in full accordance with the, the agreement that they had said yes to at Sinai. As a result of saying yes to that agreement, they went into a relationship, just like two people standing at the altar saying, I do, I do. Now they're in a relationship. Facebook has made that phrase famous. You're in a relationship and it implies that you have an agreement. Now, when we sent Michaela off to college, we thought, Chris and I, that we could give her some advice about dating. (laughs) Boy, were we wrong. (laughs) Times have changed. You know, we, we, we... Watched her play hot or not. Don't tell me, you kids, that you've never looked at a Facebook and go, oh, he's hot, check. Oh, he's not, check. You know, hot or not. You, oh, sorry, I should never have told you that. Okay? <laughs> but that's what Facebook has done to us. That's what, that's what all the funny books at college do. You know, you get people saying, based on one small, tiny picture, whether or not this person is hot. Has nothing to do with the temperature of their skin has everything to do with you know, how much space is between their eyes and their jaws, and I don't know what it is that appeals to people. But somebody's hot and somebody's not. We said, look, there are going to be guys who are going to ask you out on Friday night and one who's going to ask you out on Saturday night. This is what happened to my wife. Of course, she was very popular. Turns out we were wrong. 
Turns out that these days, it's all about the herd. It's all about the school of fish. And everybody goes around together. And if that guy asks you out, oh my goodness, he's like asking you to be his girlfriend. It's like totally opposite to the way it was like 30 years ago. Well, duh. <laughs> Things have changed. Things have changed. I'm glad, I'm glad that the Old Testament has some stories about relationship that are really great. But I'm also going to tell you that the Old Testament is full of horrific stories that the prophets uh, uh, tell that number off the offenses that have happened between this love relationship that God describes between himself and his people and how they have just torn it up. They have, they, they have just offended, shocked. In fact, there are prophets that, that comment on the fact that there are nations around Israel that are shocked, that look in on them and say, dude, how, how could you treat your God this way? This is, this is worse than we treat our God. And, and he's amazing, your God. How could you treat him that way? When Israel says to Samuel, the prophet, we want a king, Samuel is just absolutely steamed. He's, he cannot believe that they want to change the whole system. They want this relationship that they've had with God to be separated. They don't want to talk to God directly. God has to, has to tamp him down. He has to calm him down and say, you know, it's not about you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. No, you're not going to necessarily be uh, the center of attention anymore. You're not going to be in that kind of close relationship with your people anymore. They're going to have a king now that they're going to fall in love with. And guess what God gives them? He gives them Saul, who is literally head and shoulders taller than anyone else. I don't know. I, I need my my historians to tell me, but it's true so far, right? That the tallest presidential candidate always wins. Check it out. I think it's still true. I think it's still holding true. And actually in this last election, they did a measurement. And I think that our president tipped the scales just barely. Maybe he had riser shoes on or something. I don't know. Fake news, right? Fake news. Lest we point finger, though. Lest we say, oh, those Israelites, you know, they did terrible things to God. Lest we cluck our tongues or point our fingers. We need to hear what prophet Isaiah has to say to us today. He says, you can finish it probably quicker than I can. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each one. And this is very individualistic. It includes every last one of us, each one to his or her own way. At one time or another, we have all said to Jesus what you would see in that picture if I could demonstrate for you right now, her dad walking, mom walking, little child on the end of the hand, and mom and dad are holding tight, maybe not to the hand, but to the wrist now, because the hand is too slippery, but the little one is going, huh, I'm going this way, and mom is saying, huh, no, you're not, you're going this way. That tug of war has happened with each and every one of us, according to prophet Isaiah. We have all broken faith with our God and Father. We, we have all at one time or another chosen to willfully, willfully walk our own path. So when Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray, to talk to God, he says, say this. Father, forgive our debts. Debts mean more than one. It means that we, we owe. It means that we have broken the promise. It means that we have stolen. We have cheated. We have lied. That's what it means. And we've done all of this to God. 
We've offended our relationship with him. We've claimed to be his people. We've claimed to be his disciples. We have broken faith with him who has decided to be the love of our life. And we have said that we will be the love of his life. And then we have walked away. We are in debt to our God. The whole human race is in debt to our God. He is the power source of life. And we have dis regarded him and gone off on our own path. I don't know how that makes you feel, but just writing that, I can tell you it makes me feel terrible. So Jesus says, say, forgive us our debts. I believe forgiveness is a powerful, powerful thing. Jesus includes it here because it's a reconnector. It's, it's the beginning of the coming back together. I like to uh, t- tell you this piece again, and, and that's peace, P-I-E-C-E. But Jesus is the prince of peace. The root in this word is the same as connector, as reconnector. If you want to summarize what Jesus came to do in this world, he came to reconnect us with God. That is why he is called the Prince of Peace. Peace is about coming together. Peace is about reconnecting. And forgiveness is the glue. Forgiveness is the glue that brings about the reconnecting. It's it's the cleaner. It's the cleaner that cleans away filthy things. It is the maker of new days of joy and peace. Forgiveness, I believe, is uh, so awesome and and so fulfilling that Jesus says that we should ask for it. We should ask for forgiveness. But you know what? As I have thought about this, and I know you have thought about this, to ask for forgiveness takes such courage. It takes, wow, I mean, we get so close to it sometimes. We know we should do it. And then it's like, ugh, I don't know. I, I, my brother and I used to, used to jump off the diving board when we were young. Now, it wasn't just any diving board. It was the five-meter the five meter board. At our swimming pool in England, there was the one-meter board, the three-meter board, and those were the springy ones. And then there was the five-meter platform. They didn't have the 10 one because that's for the outside. But this was an indoor pool in the five meter platform. And, and as we learned how to do it, we would be at the edge like this. And the rule was you could not just jump feet first. If you went feet first, they would throw you out of the pool. You had to dive. Apparently, they said you can change. If somebody jumps out in front of you, you can change on the way down if you're going head first. But you can't change if you're going feet first. That was the rule. So there we are, and we, have to, we know we have to go head first. So what do we do? We sat down <laughs> because it wasn't as far. If you were standing up, that was another meter or so higher. So you sit down, and then you edge your rear end off of the edge, and you just uh, fall off. And that's how we learned to go off the five-meter board. By the end of the time when we were grown and ready to fly, we would back up to the back of the back and we would run all the way and then we would jump and go down. So far sometimes that we were almost out of the diving area. I did actually skin my chin on the bottom once. Learned that when you get to that water, you have to raise yourself up out of the water. Otherwise, you're going to hit the bottom. You're going so fast. takes courage. It takes courage to say, I'm sorry. I need your forgiveness. It really, I think it takes almost more courage to say that to God. When we realize how many times we've messed up and, and, and the fact that we need to come back and we need to say, forgive us our debts. I don't know how many times... Uh, It probably just drops out of our prayers and we forget about it because it's just too hard. Got to do it. 
as we ask for forgiveness from God, he asks us to square up our relationships with each other. And I think this is the reason, at least I'm going to hazard a guess at the reason why he wants us to do this. Our human relationships are a reflection of our relationship with God. Would you agree with that? We are all created in the image of God. And as we reflect that image to others, the image of God, God is glorified. Does that make sense? When we act different from the image of God, selfish, we project a different origin of our feelings and, and our intentions. One that is probably rooted in the rebellion against God of the universe. So we, we break faith with our fellow human beings who are also created in the image of God and really whom God is wanting to recreate his image in as well as us so that when we are in relationship with each other, we are glorifying God with the way that we act. Do you see how that works? If I'm created in the image of God, you're created in the image of God. If I diss on you, in some respects, I'm dissing on God. And if you diss on me, then you're dissing on God because I'm created in his image. You're, see how that works? So he says to us, if you're going to come and ask me for forgiveness, you have to realize that the first thing you need to do is ask your human counterparts who are made in my image for forgiveness. That your relationship with humanity is settled, is squared up before you come and ask me to square your relationship with me and you, God says, make sure that's taken care of. So Jesus says, when you come to God for forgiveness, part of the restoration relationship with him is restoring of relationships with other humans who are in his image as well. We're all invited to come to God to be forgiven and to find restoration of relationship with him. Jesus teaches us to say, say it with me, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. By the way, the promise of courage, and this is very important for me, the promise of courage to come to God for forgiveness is offered as part of the deal. Jesus says, even to want, even to want to be forgiven by him, the desire to have that new and or renewed relationship with him, that desire is something that he will give to us. Because we, we can't. This is one of the things that I think those who don't believe in God finally come to. And, and even this week in a conversation, I realized that, that as we were talking about this young man, he became anxious. He had problems with anxiety because he was coming to the place where he was not even living up to his own expectations of himself. And he was having trouble forgiving himself for not being what he wanted to be. So we have this, this desire in ourselves to be right, to be squared up with our world. God says, look, you're not going to be able to do that by yourself. I will give you the strength and the power through the indwelling Holy Spirit. I will give you the strength and the power to even want to do that and then to actually say the words, God, forgive me. That's a miracle. I honestly believe that's a miracle because what we're wanting is restoration of our relationship with Jesus Christ, which is what he wants. And he's basically telling us, you will not be able to achieve that by yourself. So I'll help you. I'll help you with the desire. I'll help you with the words. I'll help you with every step of the way to get back to your relationship with God. Who knew that in two sentences, 
you could know that this is all that God is hoping and wishing for us because he is the Prince of Peace. And he wants to bring us back to our Heavenly Father very, very soon. In the meantime, he says, make sure you're square with your human, human counterparts and that they know that you love them in the name of Jesus. Amen.